Hello everyone, my name is Etienne Herrick. I'm an undergraduate environmental studies student at the University of Michigan with a minor in sustainable food systems. Um, my hope is to finish up my undergrad and then pursue a dual master's from the University of Michigan School of Public Health and Environmental Health, as well as through the School of Natural Resources and Environment, um, probably something in sustainable systems. Uh, and this summer, I've been working with Kim on an environmental safety and management project, specifically creating and implementing an updated universal waste management program, which is important because many universal wastes contain valuable materials like precious metals and glass that can and should be recycled, uh, which in turn helps prevent situations like that you see in this picture where uh, locals from undeveloped countries are encouraged to actually purchase and then disassemble used electronics from developed countries uh, to resell those valuable materials at market, all the while being exposed to very hazardous materials that are contained in those electronics. So with this in mind, I uh, began my summer seeking to answer this research question. What are the required and best practices for establishing an effective universal waste program at a government research laboratory? And this is what my summer looked like trying to figure that out. I began with a comprehensive regulatory review, uh, including the EPA Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the Michigan Natural Resource and Environmental Protection Act, as well as the Department of Transportation Hazardous Materials Regulations. And I was also fortunate enough to be able to attend the Michigan Environmental Compliance Conference with Kim, as well as a Department of Commerce Universal Waste Training webinar. Uh, once I had a solid handle on the regulatory basis for waste management, I began a review of the pre-existing waste management programs here at Glural and took careful observation of actual waste management practices. Uh, and I also was able to do some personnel interviews uh, to gauge waste stream generation and disposal here at Glural. And with that information, I was able to perform an informal cost efficiency and sustainability analysis of potential disposal options of the universal waste. And finally, I began creating and implementing uh, the new universal waste program, which began with the creation of universal waste management documents and uh, regulatory guide documents. Uh, I set up waste accumulation sites. And the final step to implementation involves personnel training, which so, so far has uh, entailed some more in-depth meetings with those more intimately involved with the program, and now training for all of you. Which brings me now to the bulk of my presentation, Universal Waste Management Training. Here's a brief overview of what I'll be covering today. First, defining universal waste for you, your role in managing the universal waste, some general guidelines, some item-specific management details, the fate of the waste, some emergency response procedures for batteries and mercury-containing devices, and then I'll be introducing you to the Floral Health Safety Environmental Compliance webpage resources that we've posted there. To give you a better idea of what universal waste is, it is a subcategory of hazardous waste that includes commonly generated items, and because they're generated so commonly, uh, they are managed under less stringent regulations to encourage proper disposal, like recycling and keeping them out of municipal landfills, where they can uh, have the hazardous materials leach into soils and water, which is not a good thing. Uh, so it includes batteries, lamps, electronics, antifreeze, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and mercury-containing devices. And I would like to just emphasize that the training I'm covering now is for universal waste. So only for items that it has been determined are destined for disposal. So if you have something like a rechargeable battery that has, is out of charge but you intend to recharge it and use it again, that is not universal waste. Uh, so your role in managing universal waste will include a few things, first of which being able to know and recognize when you have a universal waste item so that you can then store them in the appropriate waste containers. Uh, and those, uh, that waste can be stored in those containers for up to one year here, uh, which you can find evidence of on the universal waste labels pictured right here. 
Uh, and the labels should have the start date of accumulation as well as an indication of the container's contents. So if you come across a container that has a start date of accumulation dating back more than a year ago or that has an incorrect content label, please let Kim know so that she can address that. And You'll see pictured here as well a wonderful Managing Universal Waste poster that uh, Kay helped us create. So those are posted around the building to help remind you of the procedures to follow in case you can't remember everything that I throw at you today. Some general guidelines to keep in mind. Uh, these are the containers are for glural items only. Uh, and please keep the storage containers closed. And any leaking or damaged items have to be kept in separate containers. And knowing that batteries are a, a common culprit of this, we already have leaking battery containers set up for you to use in the case that you should have a leaking battery. If you have any questions, please check out GLURL's Health, Safety, and Environmental Compliance webpage where we have a lot of resources to help you out if needed. And if that doesn't answer your question, um, please consult your safety officer, Kim, and she can help you out. And now moving on to some item-specific management details. Beginning with batteries, we have two main types that we're dealing with here, the first of which being dry cell, which includes the typical alkaline batteries that many of you probably deal with, uh, the AA, AAA, D cell, what have you, as well as any other type of battery that you can rotate in any orientation without it leaking or spilling. Uh, so those batteries can go directly into the used battery container and please keep in mind, if you do have a leaking battery, we'll, we will have uh, plastic baggies set up at the station for you to deposit them into and then into the leaking battery container. Uh, next, we have lead acid batteries, which are wet cell, meaning that they have liquid electrolyte that can potentially uh, spill or leak. So when storing those batteries, please keep them away from metal objects in a single layer to, keep, uh, to prevent damage. Uh, and also on an impervious surface like this containment tray that we have pictured here that we actually have set up in the hazardous waste shed for your use. And in this rectangle here, you'll see uh, the specific wording required for the universal waste labels for battery containers. You can use waste batteries or used batteries. And a very, very important note, if your battery is lithium chemistry, lead acid, nine volts or greater, electronic with cracked casing or exposed terminals, you must cover the exposed terminals. You can use tape, which we have set up near the containers for you, proper terminal covers as seen here on this lead acid battery, or a plastic baggie or else something like this could happen. This is a truck fire that happened just down the road in Jackson, Michigan several years back due to improper storage of lead acid batteries. So please be diligent about uh, putting tape or you know, covering the terminals when needed. For electric lamps, this includes, for the most part, any type of lamp that you may, coming, may be coming across here, uh, for instance, for fluorescent, high intensity discharge, neon, incandescent, uh, cathode, cathode ray tubes, and more. Uh, these can be stored in their original packaging or in any other secure container. The main concern here is that we don't want the lamps breaking because as soon as they're broken, they can no longer be managed as universal waste. So um, please keep in mind that we want them to be uh, as secure as possible. Um, and if you should break a bulb that contains mercury, like a fluorescent bulb, um, please be aware that there are specific procedures that you should follow when cleaning that up. Um, so you should reference the mercury spill response procedures document that we have on the health and safety page. And pictured in that rectangular box is the wording for electric lamps that should be used on the labels, universal waste lamps or waste lamps or used lamps. And a quick note on small capacitors and ballast. These are not universal waste, but please keep in mind they are regulated by TSCA at certain concentrations of PCBs. So if you do have a small capacitor or ballast, uh, seek him so she can make sure that we are handling them in compliance with all the regulations. 
For consumer electronics, which many of you uh, probably previously knew as the techno trash here, uh, these are universal waste items. Uh, you can think of them as any device with a circuit board or wire. So small items like this keyboard pictured can be placed directly into the electronic storage container or bulkier items can be placed in a universal waste accumulation space as long as it is marked as such and includes the specific wording required for the electronics, universal waste electronics or universal waste consumer electronics. And please note as well that disks and ink cartridges are not universal waste, so please do not put them in the electronics container. Um, instead, we will have a, a little box set up for you to dispose of them in there when you're ready for that. And the next couple of slides I'm going to cover fairly briefly because they are minimally applicable here. Uh, the first of which being antifreeze. Uh, it can be non-hazardous, but depending on its usage could be hazardous. So it does require a waste characterization before um, determining how it should be handled. So please, if you have uh, used antifreeze, see Kim and she can help you determine the next steps for managing that. And pesticides, uh, they also require a waste characterization, which Kim can assist you with. Um, but as far as I'm aware, they are not in use here at Glural, uh, so we probably don't need to worry about this. And for pharmaceuticals, this is geared uh, more towards those who will be involved with purging the first aid kits around the building. Uh, so Universal waste pharmaceuticals includes any drug taken for medicinal purposes, whether liquid or solid. So things that you would find in a first aid kit like Advil, cough medicine, or Benadryl, uh, those should be kept in their original container so it's easily identifiable what type of pharmaceutical it is. And then it can be placed directly into the universal waste pharmaceuticals container. And last but not least, mercury-containing devices. I know there have been efforts to purge this building as well as the field station of any of these. Um, but a reminder just to, to uh, check the safety data sheet or manufacturer specifications before disposing of any equipment um, because sometimes there may be a little bit of mercury in something that you may not be aware of. So please check that before disposing of it to make sure you're managing it correctly. And uh, if you should happen to have a mercury-containing device, those will not be stored in the building uh, just for safety's sake. They'll be stored out in the hazardous waste shed, so please see Kim if you have something like this, and she will help you out. So now that you have all the information about how to manage these items, it's important that you know where you're supposed to put them. So in the guest printing area by the, the Thousand Islands hallway, by all the cubicles, we have some dry cell battery containers set up uh, for both non-leaking and leaking batteries, as well as the consumer electronics container. And like I mentioned previously, we will have the box set up for disks and uh, empty ink cartridges. In High Bay, we also have the dry cell battery container set up for, again, non-leaking and leaking batteries. And we will also be adding a larger dry cell battery container for um, the uh, dry cell battery packs. So those don't need to be disassembled. You can just place them directly into the larger container. And uh, we also have the lead acid battery containment tray out in the hazardous waste shed. If you have any of the other universal waste items that don't currently have a container, um, please see Kim as we will be setting those up as needed. And as I mentioned at the beginning, universal wastes are recycled whenever possible. So if something is not able to be recycled, it's also dealt with responsibly to ensure that it's not harming the environment or us. Um, so please do know that there is a reason that we're managing these uh, as so. And now changing gears to look at some emergency response procedures. Beginning with a dry cell battery leak in an electronic device. I'm not going to go over this in detail because it's not necessarily an emergency, but please do note that if you find a leaking dry cell battery, um, there are certain procedures that you can follow to ensure that you're managing it as safely as possible. Uh, and again, 
these spill response documents are pulled directly from more thorough documents on the health and safety page. So should an emergency occur, uh, which I hope it doesn't, but just in case, refer to the online page to find uh, some more detailed guidance. Now to look at battery acid spills, um, like from a, a lead acid battery. First, notify either your safety officer or supervisor. Um, put on some personal protective equipment, in this case being acid resistant gloves, safety glasses, and an apron. Uh, and please be careful. The, if the acid gets on your skin, rinse it immediately, or if it's severe enough, seek medical attention. Um, you can deal with the lead acid battery by double bagging it in uh, something like a six mil polyethylene plastic bag to ensure that uh, it won't be leaking anywhere else. Label it as leaking or damaged, and then you can replace it back onto the containment tray. Uh, and I would like to make a note that we are in the process of putting together some spill kits. So if one should be available, you can feel free to use that in lieu of these procedures that I'm presenting to you. Uh, so if the spill is large and it looks like it may be likely to travel, make sure that you contain it using some sort of absorbent material. Uh, and then uh, you can neutralize the spilled electrolyte. And again, um, more details are included in the online documents about appropriate neutralizers. And then uh, make sure to test that the electrolyte is neutralized before continuing on. Uh, you can use litmus paper or another type of pH tester. Um, and if it's between six and eight, it's okay to move forward to transfer the spilled materials, absorbents, and any other cleanup materials into an appropriate labeled container. Uh, and that must be managed as hazardous waste, which Kim can assist you with. For lithium battery leaks, these are quite uncommon, uh, but they are a bit more serious than other dry cell battery leaks because the electrolyte contained in the lithium batteries is very irritating to both skin and the respiratory tract. Uh, so if one should occur, make sure you evacuate the area and uh, let someone know, whether it be safety officer or your supervisor. And then be sure to ventilate and isolate the area for 10 minutes, meaning shut all doors to other areas of the building if possible to minimize any exposure to venting vapors from the battery. Put on your protective equipment, in this case gloves and safety glasses. You can uh, then place leaking cell in a plastic bag and cover it with a mixture of baking soda and absorbent material. And then double bag it and seal that well. Uh, if there is any spilled electrolyte elsewhere, you can use the neutralizing and absorbing material to take care of that. And then collect all of your cleanup materials and place that with the leaking cell into an appropriate container. And again, manage as hazardous waste. For a lithium hot cell situation, which is exactly as it sounds, if you come across a lithium battery that feels hot to the touch as opposed to being around room temperature, uh, please evacuate the area as this could be an indication of an impending lithium battery fire or uh, of an, a short circuit. So if you do notice that an external short circuit is present and is that what is causing the cell to heat, remove it immediately if it is safe to do so. Um, and make sure to notify someone that this is occurring. Um, and then don't return to the area until you're sure that the cell has returned to room temperature. And then put on your protective equipment, gloves and glasses, and double bag the cell in sealable plastic bags and remove it from your work area. Uh, again, if any leaking occurred, you can follow the steps for the leaking lithium batteries that we just covered um, and managed the bagged hot cell and any contaminated materials as hazardous waste. And oftentimes, uh, it's not possible to notice that a hot cell situation is occurring prior to a lithium battery fire occurring. Um, so hopefully this never happens, but lithium battery fires are uh, very dangerous and they can proliferate uh, rapidly, so evacuate the area immediately. Um, if possible, though not likely, try to take note of what type of battery is causing the fire, uh, primary being non-rechargeable and secondary as rechargeable. Um, notify your safety officer, facility manager, and supervisor. If it's a small fire, um, qualified personnel can attempt to fight it, uh, but please do note that depending upon the source of the fire, different extinguishing agents will be appropriate. 
Uh, if it's a large fire, don't even try to fight it. Uh, be safe and just call our emergency spill response contractor, the number to which is listed in the spill response documents, or 911. <clears throat> and now for a quick look at some mercury spill response procedures. Some important information to keep in mind when dealing with mercury spills, never use a vacuum cleaner or broom to clean up mercury unless it's specifically stated in the procedures to do so. Uh, never pour mercury down the drain and never walk around if your shoes might be contaminated. Uh, pretty intuitive, but just keep that in mind. And ventilation is also an important aspect of mercury spill response. Uh, the ventilation efforts will differ depending upon the specific situation. So please check out those uh, situation specific details listed in the spill response document. Um, this is a, a pretty tame emergency. Um, it's a, if you break a mercury containing bulb like a fluorescent or a high intensity discharge sometimes contains mercury, uh, make sure to evacuate the area and notify the safety officer uh, and then ventilate and isolate. Remember closing all the doors to other areas of the building um, to minimize any exposure to dispersing, uh, dispersing mercury vapors. Um, then once you've waited about 10 minutes, you can return, put on your nitrile gloves, and you can use cardboard or stiff paper to scoop up any of the glass fragments and powder and place those in a glass jar with a lid. And then you can use sti sticky tape to pick up any remaining uh, glass fragments or powder. Go those go in the jar as well. And then uh, make sure to wipe down the spill area with damp paper towels to ensure that there isn't any residue left over. Place in the glass jar and then if it's absolutely necessary after you've done all this to use a vacuum to ensure that all the broken glass is uh, cleaned up, you can go ahead and do that. And then all of the bulb debris and any cleanup materials uh, should be placed outdoors in a protected area to be dealt with later. <clears throat> oh, and um, a quick note, there will be mercury spill response kits as, as well. Um, so battery and mercury spill response kits, if there is one available, again, you can feel free to use that um, and follow the procedures listed there. <clears throat> If a mercury thermometer or another device with a similar or smaller amount of mercury should spill, make sure to, again, evacuate the area, notify all the listed parties, ventilate and isolate for at least 10 minutes, then don your gloves. Um, if the spill is on an absorbent surface, it has to be determined whether or not decontamination is possible. Uh, and if it's not, then the affected portion may just have to be removed. But if it's on a non-absorbent surface, you can go ahead and use that cardboard or stiff paper to gather any broken pieces onto a paper towel or in a plastic bag um, and make sure that's sealed up. And then you can go ahead and slowly gather the mercury beads, being very careful not to disperse them as the mercury can spread very easily. Um, and then using an eyedropper or a similar instrument, you can pick up the mercury beads and then deposit them into the smallest lid container that you can use to contain the amount spilled. Um, and you can use tape to pick up any really tiny mercury beads that might be left over. And then that, along with any other cleanup materials, should be placed in a plastic bag as well. And those, um, again, should be placed outdoors. And Kim can help you dispose of those properly. If you spill more than a thermometer amount of mercury, but less than a pound, which in appearance looks to be about two tablespoons, uh, make sure to evacuate, notify the listed parties, ventilate and isolate, and then just call the spill response, uh, spill response team. Uh, again, the numbers to which are on these spill response documents online. And the only difference here, if you spill more than a pound of mercury, um, it is required to be reported within 15 minutes if it is released to the outside environment. Uh, I'm, it's pretty unlikely that that would occur around here, but um, if it should, either the safety officer will make that call or if she's unavailable, um, call the National Response Center. The number is listed in the document. Um, and then call your spill response team. And now uh, a quick introduction to some resources we have you on the we have for you on the Glural Health Safety and Environmental Compliance page. Uh, so under the Environmental Compliance heading, we have uh, 
several universal waste resources, uh, the first of which being a universal waste program summary that includes all of the information on the posters uh, that we have hung around the building, as well as some additional information that may be of use to you. Um, a universal waste management plan, which is much more in-depth and also has some regulatory guidance. It's unlikely that most of you will need to um, seek that out, but just you know it is there if you would like to take a look at it. Um, the poster that I was just talking about is also accessible on the website, and as well as the spill response assistance documents for the batteries and mercury, as well as a Department of Transportation emergency response procedures for universal waste guide, which I will get to in just a moment. Um, under the resources section, we have Department of Transportation assistance. Um, it's Unlikely that any of you will have to use this, but if you do find yourself in a situation where you're either offering for transport or transporting yourself some universal wastes, uh, do note that there are uh, regulations applying to the transport of universal wastes, uh, so be sure to check out the Hazardous Materials Regulations Guide uh, to make sure that you're in compliance when you're transporting universal wastes as well as carry the emergency response procedures for universal waste to make sure that you have information about how to handle an emergency should one occur while in transit. And that brings me to the end of my training. I'd like to make a, a few acknowledgments. First to Kim, my wonderful mentor, who has done a great job of guiding me through this process this summer. Uh, Tom Johengen, who's been serving as my faculty advisor as I work to uh, satisfy some academic requirements through my experience here at Glural. Uh, Mary Ogdahl, who's offered a lot of support for many situations we've encountered throughout the summer. Um, Kayla Fond and Nicole Rice for their help on the Universal Waste Graphics, Drug and Lab Disposal, which has offered uh, a lot of regulatory support and is our hazardous waste disposal facility, Travis Nestor for setting up the webinar for all these presentations, uh, and everyone who's helped me with uh, the waste stream information organizing, so DJ and Dennis from the field station, Mike Ryan here at this building, Ron Muzzy and Steve Constant from MIL, and uh, Jeff and Brad from IT. Thank you all very much for cooperating with me and helping me out. And of course, to Gloral and Siler for providing this wonderful opportunity for all of us fellows this summer. Uh, it's been a great learning experience. So thank you all for being so welcoming and supportive. Uh, so, as I just mentioned, Drug and Lab Disposal is a universal waste destination facility, so they'll be taking care of making sure that the universal wastes are distributed to uh, the best recycling facilities in the area, so like the alkaline batteries are going to be uh, recycled at a place in Howell, Michigan, that's able to recover a lot of the materials used um, and things like that, so they'll all be going to uh, either recycling facilities or disposed of by Drug and Lab at uh, a hazardous waste landfill. Any recommendations from the householder or private consumer you know, how best to deal with the problems? Or oh, sure. Yeah, so um, a great resource for that. Um, typically in households, um, you'll be dealing with things like batteries and the electronics and um, yeah, those are the two main ones, and the, the lamps, of course. There's a, a place in Michigan called Battery Solutions. They offer drop-off services, so they, they send you a container to store your batteries in, and then you ship it back to them, so you don't have to drop anything off anywhere. But oftentimes, in a lot of cities, they have hazardous waste drop-off days where you can take all of your materials um, over there, and they'll make sure that they're disposed of properly. Um, so you can find that probably on your local governmental website. Right. Um, if everybody's okay, we can keep moving. If uh, for those that want to just stay and hear the uh, remaining talks, um, we've still had a mini break already, so hopefully people are okay and we'll just keep rolling now. Anybody got to leave right now?